preservation of and increased access to the 92nd Street Y Humanities Audio Archives is generously funded by the National Endowment for the Humanities. Good to see you again. I think we're getting to know each other. Uh, we've had a good time the last two weeks, and I think you're in for another treat tonight. I know both speakers quite well, have shared platforms with them, and I'm looking expectedly to what they have to say. Just to review where we have been, uh, on Monday, March 3rd, we defined the Jewish self-interest with uh, Murray Friedman, Malcolm Henline, and Al Vorspan. And you had a very nice balance of different ideological positions and an emerging sort of uh, sense of what the Jewish interest from a different ideological point of view. And again, uh, last week, in a very spirited session, we had, again, people from different sides of the spectrum, but who really came together as often as they went apart, High Bookbinder and Julius Berman. And tonight, we've asked uh, two very prominent non-Jews who have had a long-standing interest in Jewish affairs and very, very close and friendly relations with the Jewish community, uh, sometimes as friendly critics, often as boosters. And it's a great pleasure to have uh, both Roger Wilkins and uh, Pastor Richard Newhouse here. And I'm going to begin the program by introducing Pastor Newhouse. Uh, I've known him for many years, but you should know that for eight years he was senior editor of Worldview, a monthly journal on ethics and social change. Also, he served as project director at the Council on Religion and International Affairs and Andrew Carnegie Foundation in New York City. Currently, Pastor Newhouse is the director of the Center on Religion and Society, the editor of the Religion and Society Report. He's a Lutheran uh, minister, and uh, he's a fantastically uh, prolific author. I won't go through most of his books, but his latest book, if there is such a thing as a bestseller in that field, uh, has just been published in paperback, a very, very important book uh, being talked about all over the United States, The Naked Public Square, He's somebody who has been uh, subject to feature article in Time, Newsweek, and New York Times, and in 1982 received the Faith and Freedom Award from Religious Heritage Foundation of America, and in 83, the John Paul II Award for Religious Freedom, uh, Pastor Richard Newhouse. Thank you, Irving. As uh, Irving rightly says, we have known each other for a very long time, and uh, I have great respect for the work he has done with AJC over the years, especially around the concept um, that I and others have worked on called mediating structures and the role of volunteerism and family and um, religious associations in American life. Um, in my, uh, I hope, relatively brief remarks, I was assured that tonight I, we were not promised great throngs, but we were promised a very selective audience, and I can see that that uh, is indeed the case. Um, the selective part, that is. The um, addressing uh, this uh, series of questions, and indeed addressing the questions uh, proposed by this series, is um, something that for someone who is not Jewish requires a certain amount of chutzpah, if you will. Uh, to say what the Jewish community is doing right and doing wrong, as Irving put it, and uh, how Jews might respond in all of their diversities to this particular moment of cultural, political, religious change in American life. But I um, have agreed to do it. Uh, I suppose the chutzpah is tempered by the fact that one is invited to uh, be a bit audacious. And uh, let, me, let me say that the beginning point for me in um, suggesting what needs to be considered is that we are in American life at a moment of enormous resurgence of religiously based morality in the public arena. And that this is a phenomenon that is both hopeful and troubling. I think that for most people, in at least the organized Jewish communities, it has been viewed predominantly and sometimes exclusively as troubling. I think that is a great mistake. The phenomenon in its most aggressively politicized uh, form, uh, running under the banner of politicized evangelicalism, the religious new right, uh, moral majority, now the Liberty Federation, etc., 
All of it does contain many, many dynamics which properly set off a lot of red lights in our own minds and our own understanding of what American pluralism, tolerance, and other democratic values ought to dictate as far as how we order our life together. So that there is undoubtedly cause for concern and for anxiety. But it seems to me that in many communities, including the community of organized Jewry in America, there has been not simply a, an understandable sense of anxiety, but in uh, frequent instances, a very unhealthy sense of alarm and even of alarmism. The people who have, under the banner of politicized evangelical and fundamentalist religion in American life, in recent years come in from the wilderness are not going to go away. I would begin from that premise. I would further say that we should not want them to go away. If we believe that the democratic proposition upon which this society is premised is true and one to which we are committed, we should rather welcome this new participation, even in some of its vulgarities and excessive aggressiveness, or what appears to be excessive and troubling aggressiveness, in the public arena or in the public square. In many ways, these forces, generally called moral majoritarianism or the religious new right, whether they understand it or not, whether they are fully appreciative of what they are doing, they are raising questions which have been long neglected in American life. They are raising questions of political theory and practice that we dare not neglect if the liberal democratic experiment is to not only survive but be vibrant in the future. The most basic kind of question they are raising is the question of how do we, if you will, to put it in Aristotelian terms, how do we define the good in our common deliberations about how we ought to order our life together? The political question in any society, in this society or any society, the political question, according to Aristotle, is simply an extension of ethics, as indeed politics is an extension of ethics. The political question is how ought we to order our life together? What do we mean by justice? What do we mean by tolerance? What do we mean by pluralism? And all of these issues are being forced in a sometimes uncomfortable way by people who are now moving into the public arena with a degree of clout and effectiveness which has surprised most of the leadership of the religious new right. Their success has taken them quite by surprise. And they all of a sudden are saying all kinds of things of a heavily moral character and not only of a moral character, but inescapably religio-moral in nature, which uh, alert us to the fact that we have for a long time in our society, I think at a popular democratically based level, neglected the political question, how ought we to order our life together? Who are all the different we's that come and encounter one another on the basis of the democratic proposition and try to find in this society uh, a degree of justice with which we can all live and which most of us at least can celebrate. The fact that in addition has been raised is the perduring character of religion in American life. Something has happened that has astonished many in the social sciences, many indeed the dominant theories in sociology with regard to the relationship between religion and modernity. It had been assumed for a very, very long time that as a society becomes more modern, more specialized, more technocratically oriented, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, that it would inevitably become more secular, that religion would either wither away or be confined very safely and clearly to the private sphere of life, removed from the public arena or the public square. Clearly, this is not happening. 
all of the survey research data that is available, and there is an enormous amount available over the last 10, 20 years, indicates that by all the relative indices of religiosity or religiousness, if you will, and secularity, America is a more religious population than it was 20 years ago, probably, in fact, almost certainly than it was 50 years ago. And although the evidence becomes anecdotal, the farther back we go, probably more religious than it was 100 years ago. Now, the presumed linkage, which is to be found in almost all of our textbooks uh, from grade school on up through graduate school between modernity and secularization simply hasn't happened. That is, one finds in the textbooks again and again generic statements to this effect that uh, uh, at one time, people answered these questions by recourse to religion, but of course that is no longer possible because we are or are rapidly becoming a secular society. The notion of secular America is a myth to which too many have subscribed and for which we have paid a very steep price by creating in the public arena what I have called the naked public square, namely a space where we pretend that somehow religion or even moral judgment can be excluded. But of course we can only exclude from our public deliberation the democratically based moral convictions and aspirations of the American people to the degree that we become as a society less dramatic, less democratic, that is. That is, to the degree that the people with their incorrigibly religiously based moral judgments are engaged, those judgments must be themselves engaged in the public arena. I think at the great, the best, the noblest, the most renewing moments of American life that has been understood. And I would take the most recent instance of the alternative to the naked public square as being the civil rights movement, particularly under the leadership of Dr. Martin Luther King. It was one of the great graces of my life to work closely with Dr. King as liaison between SCLC, the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, and various other change movements in America. And it seems to me that Dr. King is the exemplification of the alternative to the naked, naked public square. That is the exemplification of a genuinely prophetic posture, whereby one is able to take the aspirations, convictions, beliefs, intuitions of the common good, and in a critical way, not in a way that is chauvinistically self-celebrating or uncritically patriotic, but with a kind of critical patriotism, if you will, hold up to the country what it professes to be and to call it to a destiny which it had so tragically betrayed and still to such a large degree betrays, not only with respect to race relations, but also many, many other questions of justice hardly satisfied in America as it is at present. Well, the engagement of moral judgment and of religiously based moral judgment in the public arena is a question which today has become inescapably a front center stage in our thinking of American religion, culture, and public life. As I indicated earlier, generally speaking, it seems to me the Jewish community has not responded very positively or creatively or thoughtfully to this phenomenon. Uh, I think there are many, many reasons for this. It certainly, and this is a proposition I've tested out over the years in many forums uh, of, under Jewish auspices, and I think it is pretty well agreed, that at least by the 1930s, organized Judaism in America decided that the more secular the society would be, at least in its public manifestations, the safer it would be for Jews. The question that was asked, the question that needs to be asked and that will always need to be asked from within the community, of course, is what is good for the Jews? That's not the only question, but it is an inescapable question. And the answer to that question then, and up until very recently, was that it was good for the Jews to have as secular a public square 
a public square as denuded of religious, cultural, ethnic particularisms, especially religious, as is possible. And as I'm sure everyone here is keenly aware, there is a long, long history that goes far beyond simply the American experience of thought and practice in linking emancipation and assimilation and notions of universal values rather than particularities as being the notions that are most sympathetic to, most trustworthy uh, in terms of Jewish well-being. Today, I see in the Jewish community, and I find this very heartening, it is still a minority phenomenon, but I see a widespread rethinking, re-examination of that assumption. I see in many circles a new awareness that a genuinely naked public square, a public arena, a practice of politics, in which there are no transcendent, no ultimate values in play, is finally a very dangerous place for Jews and for everybody else who cannot lay a claim or have any hopes of becoming a majority in a democratic society. Because finally, in a totally naked public square, not only are there no transcendent visions of the good, of the just and the true and the beautiful, but there are also no transcendent, no ultimate inhibitions of evil, including the evil of anti-Semitism. And I think this awareness that we need to reconstruct something like a public philosophy that is in tune with, in conversation with, the moral, religious, cultural convictions of the American people, this awareness is a very, very hopeful one. I think it is just beginning as far as I understand the intellectual deliberations going on within American Jewry. Last month, uh, our Center on the Religion and Society, of which I'm the director, uh, sponsored, co-sponsored with Temple Emmanuel, a conference of Jewish scholars primarily on the theme of Jews in unsecular America and how Jews have responded, are responding, might more creatively respond in the future. And I am very, very impressed by the kind of scholarship being done for example, by Naomi Cohen on the 19th century experience of Jews in America, especially relative to this question of the response to a majority Christian society, uh, to the kinds of, uh, I think, truly profound deliberations of a person like Lucy Dav Davidovich, and most particularly Rabbi David Novak, who I think raises in a very provocative paper, which will be in book form six months from now, so you can all put it on your list, called Jews in Unsecular America, raises what I think is the critical question. And that is that Jews ought not to be in this new deliberation in the public square, simply reactive or simply saying, what are we as a minority to perceive our self-interest to be? But rather must in a way that is at least equal to the aggressiveness and the intelligence and the assertiveness of Christian particip participants and of non-religious participants in this new deliberation over how we ought to order our life together, Jews ought to be speaking Jewishly about the common good. There ought to be a distinctive theologically, biblically grounded Jewish understanding of how we frame what we do not now have and have not had for some time in American life. And that is a common language by which we can come to our agreements and even as the great John Courtney Murray was fond of saying, achieve disagreements. For most of what is called disagreement, said John Courtney Murray, is really confusion. Disagreement is a great achievement. It means that one shares enough common points of reference that one is able to enter into the other person's construction of reality and to pinpoint those significant points of departure which lead to significantly different conclusions. I've often said that Norman Lear and People for the American Way on the one hand and Jerry Falwell and Liberty Federation on the other do not really disagree with each other. They are not capable of disagreeing with each other. They can only rail against each other. 
because the crisis in our society is not that we have different definitions of the good, but rather that in the public square for a very long time, under the myth of secularity, we have been pretending that we can order a society without addressing the question of the common good and the ways in which the question of the common good inescapably, especially in a society as religious as this one, engages the question of ultimate goods. Let me conclude then with a quote from Henry Siegman, which I think points the right way, in the current issue of Judaism called Christian-Jewish Relations Still a Way to Go. And Henry Siegman says, I think correctly, that we are kidding ourselves, that we are all that far removed from simply the brotherhood week, take your enemy out to a lunch a week, uh, sort of uh, intergroup relations between Christians and Jews, that what is needed is on both sides, a whole new awareness of the ways within our ultimate convictions, the other party plays a significant role that deserves the respect, and indeed more than respect, the reverence of one's interlocutor. He is speaking, of course, here primarily to the Jewish community, and he says, the question which Jewish theology has failed to confront is, given the Jewish understanding of God's role in history, can so pervasive and universal a phenomenon as the rise and spread of Christianity over two millennia and over much of the globe exist outside of God's providence and salvation? Is it conceivable that the beliefs, the faith, the piety of the generations who worship him as Christians are of consequence to the Lord of history only to the extent that these are not inconsistent with the faith of Israel? And he ends up that asking those questions in no way qualifies Jewish rejection of the divinity of the Christian Messiah. But what it does do in a incorrigibly religious society, which has not been, is not now, and by every foreseeable index is not going to be a secular society, what Siegmund's question does do is ask us to move perhaps for the first time in American life to a genuine kind of pluralism in which we do not pretend in the public square that there are not significant, indeed ultimate differences between us, but the genuine pluralism in which we engage those differences within the bond of civility, reverence, and democratic respect. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor Newhouse. Uh, a brilliant exposition, I think, of a position that the Jews will have to be engaged with. Uh, our next speaker is uh, Roger Wilkins. Uh, Roger has been speaking about black Jewish relations for a number of years, and uh, perhaps we'll speak a bit about it today as well as anything else on his mind. Uh, Roger is the senior fellow of the Institute for Policy Studies in Washington. Uh, he is a Commonwealth professor, Commonwealth professor of history at George Mason University. He's the f quite a journalist, as you might know. You've read his stuff in New York Times, Washington Post, Washington Star. He's a former associate editor of the Washington Star, editorial boards of the Washington Post and the New York Times. And I first knew uh, Roger when he was the Assistant Attorney General under Lyndon Johnson for the Community Relations Service, which is an intergroup relations function of the federal government. Roger Wilkins. When we uh, first knew each other, Irving, we both had darker hair. When uh, Pastor Newhouse um, talked about the old days when they used to talk about uh, take your enemy to lunch week. It reminded me that uh, of uh, the era when I was growing up in Grand Rapids, Michigan. And I literally heard people say on a number of public occasions, some of my best friends are Jewish. Well, when I was invited here to criticize the Jewish agenda um, from a black perspective, I uh, felt a little uh, 
uncomfortable. Um, I knew I couldn't say some of my best friends are Jewish, um, but I had to establish rapport with the audience some way. So I'll tell you this. Um, a rabbi friend of mine told me with some glee recently that uh, the Reform congregations have uh, changed their definition of Jewishness so that um, Jewishness can be transmitted not only by the mother but by the father. And uh, this rabbi, who has known me for some time and uh, also knows the romantic history and thinks he knows the romantic intentions of my 26-year-old daughter, then beamed at me and said, so Roger, your first grandchild is going to be a Jew. Um, so that's better than um, some of my best friends are Jewish. And it is not indeed um, uh, irrelevant to the observations I want to make tonight. Because uh, there's a lot of uh, confusion about the relationship between blacks and Jews and how blacks have seen Jews over the years and how blacks see Jews now. The first white people I really knew were just white people, I thought. Um, and this was after I was nine years old and came here to New York. Earlier, I'd lived in Kansas City. And although you would see white people in the stores downtown and white people driving buses, you didn't know white people. White people didn't come to your home. Uh, they weren't around. But after I was here in New York, There were sometimes white people in our home. I didn't differentiate among white people. These were just white people. Years later, uh, it occurred to me, looking back on these youthful days, that all the white people whom I had known come to our home were Jewish. And indeed, all of those Jewish white people who had come to our home were of the political left. Later at the University of Michigan, I thought, well, this is a pretty swell place. It's integrated. It's pretty nice. No uh, awful racists here. I've got a lot of white friends. Then I took stock of who my white friends were. They were all Jewish. And I could go on into the civil rights movement of the 60s. I could therefore stand here and tell you that there was a terrific time in the past when, to my certain and personal knowledge, the Jewish agenda looked just dandy and just perfect to black people. I could tell you that, but it would not be true. It would be only partially true. Because for that period that we now recall <clears throat> with such warmth, the days of civil rights, When we now think that blacks and Jews stood together on all issues, there were, in fact, because we are all victims of the American culture, a goodly number of anti-Semitic blacks and a goodly number of uh, anti-black Jews. Nevertheless, the things that uh, bind us, 
found us so that those people came to my home when I was a child and were my friends in college, and some were my allies during the civil rights struggle. Are that our histories, not common histories, but histories of oppression, different histories of oppression, make us natural critics of the society in which we live, cultural critics. And though our histories are different, we have, because of those histories, a passion for justice. But we are not the same in history, and we are not the same in American society, and so blacks and Jews should not be surprised that things between us are not nearly as comfortable now <clears throat> as they seem to be in the 60s. In the time of segregation, when we were dealing, or thought we were dealing, in the political arena for justice for blacks, we didn't have to deal with the core of the American system, but rather superficial manifestations. of our national life. When we fought against segregation and discrimination, we fought primarily against irrationality and the selfish and the meanness of other people, distant people, different people, southern people. And we thought the issue was far easier then. And so we, Northern Jews and blacks, could deal easily with each other on that. And the issue of Israel was easy for us all. The Cold War was accepted with a great deal of equanimity 25 years ago. And the Israel of David Ben-Gurion and Abba Eben was an Israel which was easy for non-Jewish Americans to admire and to desire to defend. But history doesn't stand still. And blacks are beginning to understand that uh, despite our joint struggles in the 60s, <clears throat> that the black poor in this society are on the cusp of being entirely abandoned. And when I say the black poor, they are not an inconsequential group of us because a third of us are poor and that number is growing. Blacks know that that is because the economy does not work terribly well. Blacks know that the black poor are virtually isolated, not because, as the right says, of their own deficiencies or because they need to have uh, take more personal responsibility, but because between 1972 and 1984, the American economy produced five million less jobs than it needed to provide 
if it was going to accommodate the great surge of women into the labor market and not have unemployment go up. Unemployment did go up because those 5 million jobs weren't created and a great brunt of that unemployment, resultant unemployment, is borne by black men. The traditional ladder up, out of poverty into the middle class, is manufacturing employment. Unfortunately, American manufacturers are exporting their jobs to Mexico, Taiwan, South Korea, Singapore. The United States has lost about 2 million manufacturing jobs in the last five years. For black people, that is an unmitigated disaster. And what it means is that black political thinkers are moving left at a time when the country is moving right. Black political thinkers are saying America is working far less well for black people than we ever dreamed when we were struggling in the 60s that it would. This society works a lot better for other people, Jews included. So one would not expect Jewish thinkers to move to the left as rapidly as one would expect black thinkers to do. And there will be even greater splits and schisms, I suspect, between blacks and Jews in the future about what to do about this economy than even there have been in the past few years about the merits of affirmative action as a program for redressing. injustice. And then there is the problem of Israel. It is now a harder case for non-Jews to approach, in part because conservatives who are not Jewish have attempted to throw a Cold War cover over America's relationship with Israel. The president, for example, last night lumped the enemies of Israel with the Russians, the Bulgarians, and the Cubans as the people who are making trouble in Nicaragua. And it is substantially more difficult for non-Jewish Americans to look at an Israel whose personality is so deeply stamped by the policy of Ariel Sharon then it was easy to warm your heart to the Israel of Ben-Gurion and Golda Meir. And for those of us who grew up, as I have said in other places, in an era where political orthodoxy was to be against Joe McCarthy for full employment, and for a secure state of Israel, and who 40 years later still stand for those same principles, it is very difficult when you see the state of Israel do things of which you disapprove, and you voice that disapproval of the actions of the government 
without in any way meaning to attack the integrity of the state or its security, it is very difficult to do that and to be met with a wash of criticism which suggests that you have turned your back on your Jewish friends. Finally, I think that uh, there are things in our common life that are driving us apart. As I said, we're all victims, as well as beneficiaries of our culture. And there is are things unattractive in the black community on which Jewish victims of our cultural racism can pick to say blacks are unattractive and they are irresponsible and they are frightening and I don't want to have anything to do with them. And there are Jewish people who react this way. There are, on the other hand, Jewish neoconservatives who have been active in constructing academic and political theories, the object of which is to block the path of the black poor to full citizenship in this society, and who participate with Edwin Meese and Brad Reynolds in the construction of these policies. But blacks who are victims of our culture see Ed Meese and Brad Reynolds simply as same old, same old garden variety American bigots. But unfortunately, American black victims of the anti-Semitism in our society, when they see Jewish neoconservatives, particularly people who used to be our friends like Norman Bethoritz and Morris Abram, they express their opposition to them in anti-Semitic terms and unfortunately with some anti-Semitic feelings. I know that in the black community those feelings are real and deeper than they have been at any time in my adult life. I do not think that the Farrakhan business or the Jesse Jackson business are deep problems for our communities. I think Farrakhan was blown out of proportion. I think Jackson is genuinely sad for whatever insults um, he may have uh, uttered toward Jews and however his behavior might have offended Jews. I think he is profoundly sorry, and I think that he is uh, attempting to uh, express that sorrow year after year in uh, forum after forum. But I do think that the politics, uh, the political divergences, I do think that uh, the problems over how to regard and how to discuss Israel um, are serious problems and are apt to grow more severe between our two people. Nevertheless, I believe that in the future, as in the past, uh, there is a fundamental core of values which we share. Um, democracy, reverence for education, compassion, and uh, I would end with the same word that uh, Pastor uh, Newhouse ended with. Among those of us who care for our community and uh, for the common good, there is civility. And um, that has served us well in the past. And I believe that uh, with sufficient civility, there is enough common in our values so that in the future, as in the past, there will be some Jews 
in some blacks who will uh, struggle to make the soul of America what uh, many of us have dreamed that it could become. Thank you. Speakers want to take each other on. <laughs> no, no. Uh, well, a little, a, a little bit. Uh, we'll give you a chance if you want to, in some ways, uh, relate to each other's presentation. Uh, why don't you begin? If not, I'll be asking some questions. Well, let me just mention two things. It's not a question, though, of uh, taking that Wilkins on. That'd be a formidable task. And I don't feel <laughs> up to it at all. Um, but I, I failed to mention the question of Israel, which was uh, prominently in my notes as I realized time was running out. I think that um, it is a very important phenomenon that within American religious and cultural change, that there has indeed been a major shift in where the locus of serious support for Israel is. I mean, the religious new right, the evangelical fundamentalist world, for reasons that make a lot of Jews and a lot of us Christians a little uneasy, nonetheless has an intense and I think um, undoubtedly very stable commitment to Israel, perhaps even in an uncritical way, in an excessively uncritical way, as being not only a part of the predominant East-West conflict and the threat of communism, but uh, and therefore being in the national interest of the United States to be supportive of Israel, but also, of course, for religious reasons that have to do with biblical prophecy and an understanding of how history is uh, finally to be fulfilled according to divine promise. And at the same time, you have certainly a sharp decline in support for Israel among the uh, groups uh, that who are the religious components of the community that Roger Wilkins was talking about, the mainline liberal churches in America, the National Council of Churches, if you will, which is at least perceived, and I think with some justice perceived, as being, if not anti-Israel, certainly a very, very uh, uncertain um, source of um, support. Now, the other thing, and this is not so much taking Roger Wilkins on as simply to uh, perhaps speak up for some friends, but I think speak up for some truths as well. I see the kind of thinking that um, Norman Bud Horitz and people associated with commentary, public interest, and so forth, as being one of the more hopeful things happening in American Jewry. Obviously, arguments are not always made in a way as sensitively as they might be or uh, in a way that um, evades the problems or avoids the problems of being excessively uh, abrasive. But I think the basic arguments are, in many ways, very courageous and creative efforts to ask first principle questions again, not only in terms of Jewish-Black relations, but in terms of international affairs, in terms of the kind of society we are. And the labels of neoconservative, conservative, liberal, right, left, um, certainly those are always churning. I, I think one has to be robustly skeptical of um, identifying oneself or others too tightly to any of them because they're going to disappear as quickly as they once appeared. And just as the man who said, you know, marry the spirit of your time and you'll soon be a widower, and uh, so also marry any of the political labels of your time and you'll soon have an identity crisis. But um, I, I suspect this is the difference between Mr. Wilkins and myself. Some of the things which he sees as most disturbing among in Jewish intellectual life I think uh, our currents of Jewish intellectual life, which are contributing to the sort of first principle rethinking of democratic theory and practice, which I welcome. Roger, any comment? Well, I'm glad there's some good in what those fellows are doing. I don't see it. <laughs> well, let me ask you a question on that. Uh, I've heard this from many blacks, and I can understand why they feel this way. But I would say for every Norman Podhoritz, there's an Irving Howe. For every Morris Abram, there's a high bookbinder. And for every uh, Farrakhan, there's a Roger Wilkins. Uh, are we getting to the point where we don't see that anymore? Uh, are we looking for trouble? Are we looking only at the glass half empty? 
or are those the people that seem to register the most in terms of their impact? Well, I think that, uh, I think we have, a, we look at the present and compare it to a past that never was. And um, I think, as I said before, that uh, we look at the 60s as if uh, um, all blacks and all Jews were uh, marching on that road from Selma to Montgomery together. Well, it's, that's just not what happened. And um, there were a lot of people who didn't march, and there were a lot of people um, who didn't think it was a good idea. Um, there were a lot of blacks who didn't think it was a good idea for so many Jews to be involved, and there were a lot of Jews who didn't think that it was a good idea for so many Jews to be involved. What has happened more recently, however, is that Um, I think it was the Jackson phenomenon that brought, uh, made people start talking about this. Um, if it hadn't been for the Jackson campaign, Farrakhan would have remained um, what he was before the Jackson campaign and he was <laughs> apparently sliding back to be, which is um, a fringe character in the black community who was not taken very seriously by black people. And the only reason he was um, became an issue was that uh, the press took him seriously, uh, took the kind of extravagant, foolish rhetoric that he had been using for years and blacks had ignored for years, except for his own followers, and put it in the paper, and then white people became alarmed. Um, but there was um, uh, Malcolm X, who was very distressing to white people 20 years ago. But he wasn't viciously nasty the way uh, Farrakhan has been. Um, and I don't think that there were Jewish intellectuals who were, um, 20 years ago, who were actively at work. Um, spreading public skepticism about the efficacy of programs uh, designed to help the poor in the society um, and uh, designed really to say that, uh, to, to suggest that um, these governmental efforts should no longer be undertaken. That is something I think that is new in the in the in the discussion. <clears throat> but what is not new is that the organized Jewish community hardly listens to its Jewish intellectuals. Uh, 54 out of 57 Jewish organizations recently went on record, not only for affirmative action, but for goals and timetables. And it's been a hell of a problem for the Jewish community to get across to the black community that 54 out of 56 organizations is a majority. What's the problem? I mean, why must we pay for the so-called sins? They may not be. Well, I'm not attacking the- No, no, but I'm, I'm, quite, I'm quite curious as to what is it about the present black intellectual that makes him find it so difficult to see what we see, a balanced community, a community that is really uh, neoliberal and neoconservative and quite centrist in many ways, and rather, in my opinion, still compassionate on the poor, still compassionate on blacks, maybe turned off a little bit because of uh, you know, the fever and the uh, Sturm und Drang, frightened possibly by certain, uh, you know, black spokesmen and converted perhaps by some neoconservatives, no question about that. But why is there such an imbalance, uh, or apparently such an imbalance in the views of uh, black intellectuals about Jews in general and the Jewish community as an organized force in America, which still seems to be one of the few forces committed, even the vote in the last election? Uh, why is that not registered? I think it has. I think it has. I think also, Irving, uh, yes. I, I don't know if it's your favorite magazine or not, but uh, in <laughs> we're, commentary... We're both recently, on the seventh floor. <laughs> that's right. You're over in the same building. On, uh, in commentary, uh, I think a couple of months ago, uh, Glenn Lowry yes, had right. uh, a long article on, on blacks and Jews. 
and in many ways agreeing with what Roger Wilkins said, namely that you have this great divide of right. black intellectuals moving left and analyzing why that is. The difference, of course, is that I gather that Glenn Lowry thinks this is a lamentable development, whereas uh, others may think it a, a very sensible response of black intellectuals. Yes, that's one of the questions that Jews are asking too now, Roger. You've got a gang of uh, brilliant black I think they are. They may not. I may not agree with them, but they sure are brilliant in their advocacy. Brilliant black neoconservatives. Uh, take them on instead of us. Oh, I have. <laughs> I know. I, th I have said publicly that I think that Glenn Lowry is a lamentable development. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I, he's, I, a, he's a good friend, and I, I, I think friend. an admirable human being. I want to. I want to throw uh, past the Newhouse a question, uh, and then we can go to the audience. Uh, Richard, I'm more worried than you seem to be about who's going to be in this naked public square. I mean, you seem to think that all these guys coming in are good for the Jews. Uh, I'm not so sure. I wonder if uh, Pat Robinson uh, is going to be good for the Jews uh, as he enters into the naked public square and maybe is already there. Uh, he may be good for others. He doesn't appear to be somebody that uh, is, uh, on the face of it, good for what Jewish interests have been in America. Uh, are we to accept his legitimacy in the naked public square? Uh, that I can accept, but do we have to like it? Oh, <laughs> no, no. I, I'm, um, you know, your basic question, who's going to be in the naked public square? We the people, the yeah. people of the United States. And the fact is that a very, very large sector of the American population feels that for 50 years or so, it had been effectively excluded from the public square. Now, others may say it excluded itself, and then one can go back and forth on the historical questions. But that very large world of self-consciously, deeply committed, evangelical fundamentalist, uh, that world, okay, clearly they belong in the public square if we believe in democracy. Now, am I saying that that's necessarily good for the Jews? No, nor good for anybody else. No, not even good for evangelicals and fundamentalists or good for Lutherans. I, I'm not at all sure of that. All I'm saying is that they're there, they're here, they're not gonna go away. And therefore, the only question for us is, how do we most constructively respond to their participation in a way that, at least as much as it is within our hands to determine, will be good? For, for everybody involved. But a Pat Robertson uh, candidacy, which is a very live possibility, I think raises a, a lot of questions. Not only uh, Mr. Robertson, but uh, many people in that world, I think do not sufficiently understand that in the public arena, public policy must be debated on the basis of public reasons. That is that you cannot come in, the answer to the naked public square is not naked religion in public. It's not coming into the public square saying, thus saith the Lord, or quoting Bible passages at each other. We have to find a genuinely public language, and by a public language, I mean a language that is accessible to every person uh, who is reasonable and of goodwill, whether that person subscribes to the belief system and the religious commitments that the majority embraces or not. Now, we haven't even begun to do this in our society, and that's what I was alluding to before when I said that we lack a common language for debate and deliberation in the civil way about these questions. And it would be a terrible thing were the Pat Robertsons, and I don't mean to just single him out, but were the Pat Robertsons of the world to be the um, cutting edge of a kind of raw majoritarianism in American life, which is the uh, perversion of the democratic impulse, a kind of uh, uh, unbridled populism. And that dynamic is very much there within the religious new right. Therefore, it is all the more urgent that we, and I mean all of us who are not part of the religious new right, and particularly the Jewish community, um, but not alone by any means, engage these people within the bond of civility and say, okay, how now are we going to talk about the common good? What are your public reasons? Don't cite your Bible passages at me, but give me your public reasons for how we ought to order our public life together. Now, just as you've it's a big task. Yes, you've advised the Jewish community, and you even quoted my colleague Henry Siegman, uh, mm. the most separationist 
of the Jewish groups as wanting to enter in the Congress, yeah, uh, the American Jewish Congress. So I think you'll find the American Jewish Committee willing to enter in. But uh, who do we find in this square? I mean, is it going to be taken over uh, by people who have no sympathy for Jews and no sympathy for blacks? What I'm saying to you is as we enter into this uh, naked public square where religion becomes the major factor, something that we're not used to, uh, we're used to the secular society, as you said, uh, we're not as adept, perhaps, at dealing in the public square with all these religious forces. Uh, uh, the last time we encountered them <laughs> in Europe, but we didn't do too well in that competition. And the question is, uh, will groups like blacks do well? Uh, one of the things I'm curious about is, are you also advising the black community to get its theology in line so it enters in also as a theological force as well as as a ethnic or racial force? I mean, would you give the black community the same advice since you did quote King and indicate mm. that that was a, a religious movement? Is there something missing today from black strategy that would bring them into this framework? Well, actually, we're uh, doing a conference in a couple of months on uh, blacks and on secular America <laughs> on precisely this thing. Yes, it's a question that engages all of us, Irving. Uh, you know, Walter Lippmann talked a long, long time ago about a public philosophy. All right. Um, and uh, in uh, his notion of America drifting, he deplored in his time the absence of such a public philosophy. Certainly John Dewey and uh, people of that sort recognized the need for some kind of shared language for moral deliberation and talked quite frankly about a common faith, a democratic faith that would be the successor to and would replace the particularist faiths so of Judaism, Christianity, uh, denominational uh, brand names. Well, that didn't happen. I mean, however good and well-intended a John Dewey was, however well-intended a Walter Lippmann was, however well-intended those who participated in that discussion over the decades were, the America that they envisioned in the modern world they envisioned has turned out to be something very, very different. Now we have the much more difficult task to engage one another in our particularities Jews and Christians and Roman Catholics and blacks and whites and increasingly Muslims and Hindus and Buddhists in this society and to say how in the genuine pluralistic encounter of our particularities do we begin to construct perhaps for the first time something like a public philosophy for a democratic society. I am not at all sure, let me underscore this, I am not at all sure that we're going to succeed in doing it. I am very sure that a liberal democratic experiment cannot be sustained with a naked public square without any compelling democratically legitimated beliefs. Any comments by Mr. Wilkins? And then we'll go to the audience. Um, well, just a profound pessimism about that enterprise. Um, it, uh, it sounds much too... Um, philosophical, like a much slower process than um, we have time to do. Um, I suppose that uh, I wish that um, we could um, see a common good in this society um, soon enough to have a civil, well-referenced debate, but um, I think that um, there are urgent things on our public agenda that are going to make us make do with uh, the tools we have. Um, I think that uh, I think that um, we have to deal with um, Star Wars, um, and that's urgent. Um, we have to deal with the transformation of our economy and um, with its transformation from a <clears throat> strong manufacturing base to um, something that is less vibrant, less fertile, less solid. 
which uh, threatens to uh, impoverish many of our people. And we have to do it at a time when the language of our politics is not getting more civil, uh, but more strident and more strained and more changed. Um, and when the impulses of the people who hold the levers of power um, are anything but democratic, um, and whose goals, um, her true goals, are masked by the misuse um, and mangling um, of our national symbols rather than any effort to form uh, some kind of um, general framework in which a common and civilized debate can go forward. So um, I guess I think that uh, those of us who are on the um, being victimized by things like uh, Star Wars and um, uh, president's tax and domestic programs and uh, by uh, um, the uh, massive capital flight from this country um, cannot wait till the public square gets filled up with uh, civilized debate and have to pick up whatever crowbar is at hand to defend ourselves. Okay, let's, let's get it out there. I think the gentleman over there. I think you're right in, in your perception of the non-response on the part of um, mainline Christian leadership. On the other hand, um, I would emphasize that there's a great deal of disorganization, a great deal of fragmentation and polarization within Christian leadership, uh, more so than uh, has been the case in American history, where the so-called mainline churches, the churches that are in some sense the heirs of the culture-forming Puritan democratic tradition in American life feel themselves very marginalized by um, 
what, uh, say, the National Council of Churches uh, routinely describes as the turn to the right of the country, the conservatives. They don't feel that they have uh, a voice that is going to be heard anywhere. Uh, I mean, an astonishing question one could ask, uh, not only didn't they address the element of polarization and incivility represented by a Farrakhan, but uh, they have not in any way played a mediating role with regard to the reaction of some in the Jewish community and myriad other communities to the religious new right. Indeed, to the contrary, they have themselves been part of the polarization. And so this is a kind of collapse of influence, credibility, and self-confidence on the part of mainline liberal Protestant leadership in America. And the Roman Catholic Church is a whole other story in how they're finding their culture-forming role. It is precisely this question of polarization, this question of lining up good guys and bad guys, which makes it so very difficult uh, to create the kind of uh, move toward a public philosophy that uh, I'm urging. And of course, Roger Wilkins may be right in saying that uh, maybe there isn't time for that and maybe that can't be done. But I would, um, if I may come back to your remarks, uh, Mr. Wilkins, point out that even in your description of those things that needed to be taken care of now, and the question of uh, uh, programs to aid the poor, Star Wars, et cetera, et cetera, and the other things, these themselves, see, in the way that you presented that, it seems to me is part of the problem. It's sort of like the assumption that we people who care about American democracy and justice and who are compassionate and so forth, we are all agreed on that. And those people who disagree with us, and in fact, you even said of this administration that you don't see any democratic impulses there. Well, they are then somehow beyond the pale of the kind of democratic discourse that needs to be established. I think it terribly important for us to understand that the great debates before the American, society, American people are not the debates over Star Wars or what welfare policy ought to be, or although all these are terribly important, I don't mean to minimize them, but they are not the great debates. The great debates is whether it is true, as at one time presumably it was true, that you had a society premised upon people saying together, we hold these truths. Here are the truths that we hold to be self-evident that are of transcendent and binding importance upon all of us. And only when we can get to that level of civility, and but civility is not a wimp word, it's not simply being nice to each other, that level of civil commitment, commitment to the civitas, okay, together with the Ronald Reagans and the Mises and the Roger Wilkins and whomever, okay, that unless we strive to do that, I don't think we are going to do anything other than simply continue to pull ourselves apart in this society, and the most bloodied victims of it are going to be those who are not part of the religio-cultural defined majority in this society, including Jews and blacks. At least, now that's, so if you're not hopeful, you can see I'm, I'm very doer indeed in terms of what I think the, the probable uh, outcome is, unless there is major Well, I was, first of all, I did not, <clears throat> when I listed the uh, urgent um, issues, I did not list welfare policy among them. Um, I listed uh, Star Wars and the transformation of the American economy, which is uh, very different from welfare policy. Um, secondly, I think that um, that'd be nice to have that. I don't think we ever had it. Um, I don't think that uh, I don't think that uh, everybody held those truths to be self-evident um, back there 200 years or so ago. Um, I think there was a lot of disagreement among people about what this society was to be about. Um, I think there is fundamental disagreement now. Uh, I think it is in the nature of human beings that it is, there is going to be fundamental disagreement, and I mean basic from the gut disagreement. Some people believe that this society was designed to enable them 
to buy the biggest and fastest damn car they can and drive it as fast as they can down the road in Idaho and repeal the 55 mile an hour speed limit because that impinges upon my freedom. And that is what a lot of people think this country is about. And you try to talk to them about a new language and a civic ideal, and um, they will think you are from Mars. Um, no, I'm talking about the intellectual and cultural leadership of the country, Mr. Wilkins. Well, People presumably such as are gathered in this room. I don't think, I think that the I think that there are people in the political leadership of this country who exert, right now, who exert um, uh, much of their intellectual energy to protect and enhance the impulses of that citizen I just described. OK, let's get some more questions. Uh, the gentleman down here, yes. So many questions were raised today which actually cannot be answered within the framework of the meeting of this time. But what is clear to me is that Ashton Newells and Mr. Wilkins did not talk on the same level. Ashton Newells spoke from a religious, ethical point of view as he was as a I did not hear any words of this kind, and understandably, on the part of Mr. Wilkins. Mr. Wilkins spoke exclusively politically. He spoke exclusively economically. <coughs> the political and economic matters affecting the black community and vice versa the Jewish community were those that Mr. Wilkins was talking about. And the answers each one gave to the other did not really uh, uh, were, were not really on the same level. And this is one of the problems why the American Jewish Committee and the ADL uh, have separate intergroup relations committees. One is black Jewish, one is uh, Christian Jewish, and then they are not Christian Jewish, they are Catholic Jewish, they are Episcopal Jewish, and whatever other Christian uh, sect is prepared uh, to talk on the same level to the Jewish community. I believe that we have to look at the problems that we encounter from that point of view. And if I may say one thing in that connection, when you, talk, when you, Mr. Wilkins, for instance, talked about the altered attitude of the black community, which also is divided, it is not the black community. And to talk of the Jews is just as wrong or even worse, because the three main lines of Judaism do not agree on anything as far as relations are concerned, either to blacks or to the Christian community. When you talk uh, of the changed relationship to Israel, you did not with one word mention the Arabs or the Muslims. It appears to me from what I read, and that's all I know, that there is a large number of Muslims within the black community. Obviously, they have a different attitude toward Israel and its relationship to its land outside its borders uh, than the Christian that I'm going to have to ask you to conclude because there are a lot of other questions, yes. Thank you very much. Uh, we'll hold the answers and let's get some more questions. Yes, that lady. I also was very disappointed in this <laughs> mainly for the same reason. This gentleman was very nice. Uh, I don't he didn't say he was disappointed in me. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> Don't tar him with your brush. That's right. <laughs> Let me ask all the questioners to make their questions quite short. Yes. You're going to have to just Who make. Uh, the yes. To stay outside of the school and not go into it. The education is available. You must agree with me that education is available. Okay, let's hear the answers to that. Okay. Uh, let's get another question. Yes, mom. Yes. Yes. Go ahead. We'll take your question seriously, but just wait a few minutes. Yes. 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 Go ahead. Who are you addressing this question to? Yes. yes. Just, just let me yeah. be clear on that ad so people have the facts. This was sort of a, uh, a centrist ad, you know, if I, I characterize it, of people who were sort of uh, maybe hardline centrists uh, uh, in terms of, uh, of, 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 well, it could have been. It could have been, it could have been interpreted that way, but I, I looked at the names and they appeared to me people who were supporting the president uh, not on his own terms, but uh, supporting aid, and they look to me like a group of what I would call centrists in American I love society. Hardline centrists, that's a great <laughs> phrase. <laughs> well, to respond to your question, no, these, uh, this dialogue, this engagement uh, of our particularities does not take place in a vacuum. And obviously there are power consequences, and consequences for people, both good and bad. Ideas have consequences as Richard Weaver wrote in his modern classic. That's undoubtedly the case. It is also undoubtedly the case that many of the people who are dealing with these ideas also have very definite political agendas. And uh, it is, I think, difficult for all of us when we talk about public philosophy or about democratic theory and so forth to at least distance ourselves to some degree about specific public policies about which we feel very strongly and to say, look, let us bracket our disagreement on whether or not it's a good idea to support the Contras or as others would have it, the freedom fighters in Nicaragua. And let's talk about how do we define American national interest, for example, or the role of national interest in making judgments, which are inescapably moral judgments about what America's role in the world ought to be. Okay, so we have to distance the partisan political agendas as much as possible for this discussion that I'm calling for to make any progress. While at the same time, we cannot ask people who engage in this religio, cultural, philosophical discussion to be political eunuchs. At the same time, they are actors within the debates that are going on. And that is part of the very difficult process of developing civility, of being able to make those distinctions. See, I, I think that uh, uh, Jaime Bookbinder has not done anything 
wrong by signing that ad, whether it's a hard center ad or neoconservative ad. I mean, I, I looked over the list. There were some of my friends on that ad. People can le very legitimately in this society make different prudential judgments and moral judgments with regard to what U.S. policy ought to be in Nicaragua. Well, no, they would say, and I'm sure Hammy Bookbinder were he here would say, and I would, I would not doubt him for a moment, that he signed that ad because he believes the policy he's advocating is going to save lives and is going to help people. Part of civility is to credit the other person's intention. Look, that's absolutely basic. If we say that those who disagree with us on specific policy judgments are to have their intentions impugned, that they are not people of goodwill or that they do not participate in the same democratic vision that we do, well, then, of course, we are simply headed on the course of increased fanaticism and polarization and the end of anything that would approximate the idea of democratic discourse. You cannot impugn somebody's goodwill simply because you make a different judgment with respect to what is the wise and the right U.S. policy in Nicaragua. That gentleman, yes. Yes, and the other gentleman behind you. You first, and then the gentleman here, yes. Uh, after hearing this discussion tonight, I know what it's like to feel between the rock and the hard place. But uh, how do you, uh, Pastor, how do you expect Jews with the, the, their history to look at the religion and uh, organized religion and equate that Roger, you want to take that? Sure. Um, since you and Irving both um, drew that from my comments, I obviously uh, wasn't very clear. Um, I am not, uh, I am known in the black community as a guy who's soft on Jews. And <laughs> Uh, I was uh, uh, a senior advisor to Jackson in his campaign, and Jackson used to, if he valued me for anything, he valued me because of, uh, he thought that I could make him look better in the Jewish community than um, he sometimes deserved to look. Uh, so I don't, I don't come here with hostility in my, uh, in my uh, heart, um, nor do I seek to um, <coughs> minimize at all the very major contributions that Jews made to civil rights 20 years ago. Um, nor do I uh, mean that uh, the weight of Jewish politics in this country is not on the side of decency and compassion as I define those terms. I simply mean that um, the differences um, which existed 20 years ago um, exist now um, and are more evident now than they were then. And that I suspect 
that in the future, the differences may grow greater rather than lesser. That's all. But I do not mean at all um, either not to count the weight of organized Jewish opinion um, today or to give due credit to uh, Jewish contributions to the civil rights movement 20 years ago. You want to try that question from the lady about uh, what appears to be uh, another, again, a growing debate in the United States about black social responsibility, black self-help, uh, uh, black taking care of business at home and not asking for handouts, et cetera, all that, that stuff that's hitting the television and, you know, is again in the public air. Uh, how do you view it? Do you view it any differently than you viewed it all along? Oh, I view it very differently now. Um, I think that uh, um, middle class values and middle class behavior are basically luxuries that money can buy. And that poor people of all stripes um, do not act the way middle class people do. Um, when people don't believe in the future, um, they seek immediate gratification. And they do not take actions which are designed to achieve long-term goals because the long-term goals do not seem realistic. And this is true in any culture, for example. When I was in South Africa, white middle-class parents told me that they were having a very difficult time getting their children to study, teenage children to study. Because usually you get your children to study by saying, study hard and we will pay for you to go to college. And if you go to college and do well, you'll get a good job and your future will be assured. So the kid studies, and then he goes to college, he studies some more, and everything works out. The white kids in South Africa, many of them do not believe in the future. They believe they will be sent up to fight in Namibia and get their heads blown off, or they believe that there will be a black revolution or the economy will crumble in some way or another. So many parents are finding that when they say to their kids, you study hard tonight, the kid says, and goes to the disco. Black, poor black kids, particularly poor black males, um, see all around them evidence of no employment opportunities for teenage and older black males. We are raising generations of poor blacks, males in the central city ghettos um, who are just outside um, our employment, uh, um, our traditional economy. And you can't teach middle class values in a jobless vacuum. You just can't do that. Now there are things. There's been a tradition of self help in this, this, uh, in the black community, since blacks have been in this country. Glenn Lowry and uh, his oak uh, pretend that they invented the tradition of self help in this country, and they invented the exhortation to middle class blacks to. Uh, engage in self-help. The fact is that the black civil rights movement, which is uh, essentially a self-help movement, had been led by middle-class blacks since it was started. Um, Martin King was as middle-class as they come. Uh, Thurgood Marshall was of the black middle-class. Andy Young is of the black middle-class. Eleanor Holmes Norton is of the black middle-class. Um, and all of these people, and uh, literally millions whose names 
we don't know, are engaged as actively as they know how in black self-help efforts. I believe, and I have written, that uh, there is more that the black middle class needs to do. We have to be more ingenious, more inventive, more energetic, but we can't do it by ourselves. The fact is the economy is failing these people. The black unemployment rate was a steady double that of the white rate up until the election of 1980. Since then, the black unemployment rate is two and a half times the white rate. If white unemployment had been as high as black unemployment over these last seven years, we'd be very close to a revolution in this country. White people wouldn't stand for it. The only reason black people stand for it is we don't have the power to make the trouble that our depressed and devastated economic condition warrants. And it is clever for people to blame the victims of an inefficient economy for their woes. And it may make political sense, but it just isn't true. These people are victims of an inefficient American economy that does not produce enough jobs for people who need and want to work. Let's take a few more questions, well, I promise. Like yes, to, go ahead. I mean, just, just on this one, because there's so much that Mr. Wilkins has said that I agree with, and we're obviously getting down to a particular perspective on a very real problem in American life, and one that I've spent most of my adult life fretting about, and I'm not at all clear that I have answers on it. I've, for almost all of my adult life, been pastor in the Williamsburg Bedford Stuyvesant section of Brooklyn from the early 60s on through the 70s, and I've seen the devastation that has happened with the people for whom I was pastor. And I'm talking about black America now, and the new phenomenon is the, is the phenomenon of an of an underclass, as it's called, or lumpen proletariat, whatever term is used. It's not all blacks by any means. Uh, Two-thirds of the blacks in America, and certainly the top third, is doing very, very well indeed. The question is, why do we have this new thing? And I, as I say, I don't know what the answer is. Uh, some of you, I'm sure, saw Bill Moyer's program on the black family of some, about a month or so ago. And a lot of people have said, well, that's a watershed. And now in a way that it was not permissible to talk about it when Pat Moynihan brought it up in the middle 60s, it is now permissible to talk about what's happening in the black family. And that could be a good thing if we're talking about, again, that underclass. It could also be a bad thing, however. And there I would simply uh, agree with uh, Mr. Wilkins' point, a bad thing if people say, aha, well, what it means is that these people are creating their own problems, and we just let it go at that. We have, as a society and through public policies, contributed in many ways, I think, to those problems. Um, Charles Murray, I'm sure you're familiar with his book, Losing Ground, um, makes a very interesting argument that, in fact, the anti-poverty programs, war and poverty programs, not only did not achieve their purpose, but exacerbated precisely the problem they were intended to address. I do not find Mr. Murray's argument uh, convincing on all scores by any means, but I think he is raising a set of questions. The question, it seems to me, is how are public policies redesigned in a way to empower the poor, and particularly the black northern urban poor, but not the black urban uh, poor al alone, to empower the poor to act upon their own enormous capacities for uh, self-help, for self-approvement, self-advancement, for family care, for fidelity, and an awful lot of other things. Clearly, there's a crisis when you have a specifiable community. In Bedford-Stuyvesant today, what, 80% roughly of all the children born last year were born out of wedlock. Uh, the majority of black children born in America today and the great majority of poor blacks are never going to have the experience of having a father in the house. The ramifications of that are enormous and intergenerational in character. But that doesn't mean, and that's where I think this argument and this whole discussion has to be handled with enormous carefulness, it does not mean that it is simply the fault of that community. 
that community, I don't think either that means that it's a fault of the economy. And here I would disagree with Mr. Wilkins. I don't think the economy has failed. Uh, I think a lot of public policies and ideas that have been formative for public policy clearly were wrong, however well-intended. And I think we have to allow that they were well-intended. Uh, and therefore, here as well as in so many other areas, we have to go back to the drawing board and ask first principle questions that get us away from the simplistic partisan polarizations over these issues, which unfortunately dominate this discussion as well as others. That gentleman and that gentleman and that gentleman and here. But they have to be very short because we're running out of time. Yes. It's the price, yes. Yeah, I put I butt my nose into everybody's I business. Was, it's I was quite surprised to see you quoted this thing that there was a Christian, no, the Christian position on only three matters: abortion, slavery, and anti-Semitism. And I found that uh, rather surprisingly narrow consensus within the uh, Christian community. <clears throat> and I was wondering uh, what. Uh, benefit would come from Jewish participation uh, in a common language public debate on a much broader range of issues. I was wondering how productive it would be. Want to take that? Oh, uh, yeah, very <laughs> briefly, I was misquoted. Uh, <laughs> 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 the, the important point I did, I, I was making in San Diego, and I, I would also make here and, and elsewhere, and that is that within the Christian community, there is an enormous propensity today, not simply today, it's always, it's been endemic in 2,000 years of Christian history, to excommunicate people over quest disagreements of a very penultimate uh, character and particularly of a political character, so that if people do not agree with your political agenda or your understanding of justice, that then you, uh, in effect, excommunicate them or read them out of the church. And so I was making the point to that Catholic audience that it is terribly uh, urgent that we all understand that within the community of faith, with regard to ultimate questions, there can be, and indeed should be, the liveliest kind of engagement with one another on our penultimate questions and disagreements. Go, go back, uh, since you've got the floor, go back to the question before, which I know puzzles many Jews. Uh, perhaps our lack of understanding of Christianity uh, is part of the problem over here. The language may be different. Uh, when uh, one talks about Christian morality, uh, I guess Jews run. Oh, yes, and, yeah, this and gentleman. That's an, that's this an gentleman, issue. Yes. Uh, yeah. Are we talking about what many Jews think is uh, phony moralism or uh, moral hucksterism? Uh, that's an impression that many Jews have about religiosity, especially a, a form of Christian religiosity. This frightens the dickens out of us. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, I think the, uh, yeah, the, the question raised about religion and morality, and is religion necessarily moral? Of course not. Horrible things have been done in the name of religion. Pascal said, never do men do evil so joyfully as when they think they are doing it for God's sake. Uh, and, uh, and we know the history of that. At the same time, I would emphasize that the um, naked public square, that is a society in which the religiously based values have been largely excluded, is a much more dangerous place. And most particularly with regard to uh, your implicit reference to the Holocaust and to the Jewish experience in uh, Europe and uh, under Nazism. It is very important to remember that this was not a Christian society. And I make a very strong argument that um, both the great horrors of our time in terms of the massiveness of human suffering 
uh, Stalinism and Nazism, were both classic instances of the naked public square, namely where the state established a definition of political decision making and controlled that and monopolized that decision making in a way that prevented the intervention and the tempering influence and the criticism of other communities that operated by transcendent values by which the state could be brought under judgment. In other words, the epitomizing of the state, the apotheosisizing of the state, if you will, against any transcendent or religious belief was certainly the case and the clear ideological intent in both Stalinism and in Nazism. Uh, the naked public square creates a vacuum which will be filled with some kinds of absolutes if they are not filled with the absolutes of authentic religion. But that doesn't mean that there is any safe, utterly safe, guaranteed safe society for anybody. The liberal democratic experiment remains a very dicey experiment. It is precisely that 200 years later. I still think it's the most worthy and exciting and the one to which we ought to bend all of our efforts in order to sustain and make it more vibrant. But let's have no illusions that there are any guarantees or that there is any such thing as a safe society for Jews or for anybody else. Roger Wilkins, any final words? If not, did I promise you? Yes. <laughs> okay, we'll take two more quick questions. Yes. Well, first of all, with regard to Jew blacks are overwhelmingly Christian in this society, uh, as overwhelmingly as is the white population. Well, and a lot of it, uh, Christians don't act very <laughs> Christianly toward one another uh, historically, and that's likely not going to change until the kingdom of God comes or there's a massive outpouring of the Holy Spirit, the evidence of which I haven't seen. Um, but the no, we are saying that morality, well, the argument is that morality, that politics is a moral enterprise, that in the political arena, we are moral actors. We are making judgments about right and wrong, fair and unfair, just and unjust, okay? That is what politics is about. Politics is not an antiseptic, surgical... Huh? No, no, what, what do we debate in politics? What we debate in politics is what is right. What is just? Is this fair? Is this not fair? And that's what all our debates are about. In name any political issue, it is finally, scratch it a little deeply, there's a question of moral judgment involved, in which some people are saying, look, that isn't right to do it that way because it's bad for so-and-so, or I don't get my fair share, or that sector of the population gets too much. All of politics, as Aristotle said, my basic is an extension of ethics. I think okay? we're going to have to stop. And well, yeah, I just yeah, may sorry, simply yeah. say that whether we like it or not, it's not a question that I'm recommending this alternative to the naked public square. I am trying to be as descriptive as I can and say that if we are going to continue as a democratic society, it will have to change because whether we like it or not, up to well over 90 percent, almost unanimity of the American people believe, rightly or wrongly, that their moral judgments are derived from religion, which is overwhelmingly Judeo-Christian tradition. And they can, they'll say, it, you know, they get their morality from the Bible or from the teachings of the church or from the Ten Commandments or the Torah or, or the <laughs> Sermon on the Mount, whatever. They may know very little about this. They may not even be able to name three of the Ten Commandments, okay? But nonetheless, in social reality, that is the assumption that that is the basis and the source of moral judgment. In such a society, you cannot therefore divorce religiously based moral judgment from public deliberation. And I am saying that the naked public I, square I, is an I think we're going to have to yeah. end it there. I'm sorry everybody did not get that question. And 
But uh, thank you, Roger Wilkins, and thank you, Pastor Richard Newhouse. <laughs> well deserved hand of applause. Uh, not next week, but two weeks from now, the final uh, program uh, of our series, The Jews in Pluralist America, Where Do We Go From Here? David Gordas, Executive Vice President of the American Jewish Committee, Henry Feingold, uh, famous Jewish historian and author of a midrash on American Jewish history. See you in two weeks. Thank you. Good. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks for listening. For more information on the 92nd Street Y New York and all of our programs, please visit us at 92ny.org. 